Uh, welcome everyone. We have the echo taken care of. Uh, we are at 1130, so we'll get started. Uh, it's Monday, November 8th, and I'm Peter Gray, excited to share an introduction for today's virtual speaker joining us all the way from New York. So we're delighted today to be joined by Dr. Sally Hahn. Dr. Hahn is Professor of Anthropology at SUNY Oneonta. She's a longstanding research expertise in the anthropology of reproduction. Within that scope, she is, she's authored a book entitled Pregnancy and Practice, Expectation and Experience in the Contemporary United States, co-edited a volume on the anthropology of the fetus, culture, society, and biology, and most recently co-edited with Dr. Cecilia Tamori of Johns Hopkins, a brand new volume entitled the Rutledge Handbook of Anthropology and Reproduction. This most recent volume has 39 chapters. Yes, you heard that right, 39 chapters, and is an ambitious work synthesizing cultural and biological anthropological approaches and research on the subject. To the UNLV community, you have digital access to the volume and its chapters through the UNLV library, and some, several of us have chapters in it that we're also reading in a fall anthropology graduate seminar on the evolution and variation in human reproduction. Dr. Hahn has had many other academic contributions and impacts. She's been co-editor of Open Anthropology, the digital journal of the American Anthropological Association, is a past chair of the Council on Anthropology and Reproduction, and has given invited talks at various institutions, including the University of Cologne, the Brochure Foundation, and Durham University. She received the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2018. Today, Dr. Hahn talks about the climate of reproduction in anthropology. Her presentation touches on an anthropology of reproduction in a time of global emergencies, but also on themes such as a people-centered and holistic approach that can be found in the new volume she is co-editing. From difficult times, we can all celebrate the birth of something good. And with Dr. Han here today, we are doing just that with her presentation and effectively the launch of her new edited book on anthropology and reproduction. So welcome, Dr. Han. Oh, yay. Thank you so much. That was, you made me sound great. <laughs> so um, I'm so grateful to Dr. Gray and to the UNLV Department of Anthropology for this really kind invitation. And many thanks to all of you who are either in person or online to uh, for making this time to, to come and hear me talk about the anthropology of reproduction. Um, uh, as Dr. Gray mentioned, uh, it's a special occasion because uh, we are indeed celebrating the publication um, of, this uh, of this volume this month. And uh, so the uh, Rutledge Handbook of Anthropology and Reproduction, which features uh, the work of Dr. Gray and Dr. Crittenden and your graduate students. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think the students in this department particularly are just very fortunate uh, to be learning from these really outstanding scholars who are really showing us the way forward uh, in reproduction. Um, so before I begin, uh, because I am talking with you from my office on the campus uh, of the State University of uh, New York in Oneonta, I need to acknowledge that this institution is situated within the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy on the lands of the Oneida Nation and bordering the lands of the Mohawk Nation. We recognize the enduring presence of indigenous peoples on these lands. So today I want to make a case for the anthropology of reproduction and how and why it matters in these time of global crises. I draw on my work on pregnancy as a sociocultural anthropologist, also working in linguistic anthropology, um, and I've enjoyed the advantages of collaborations with anthropologists across the four fields. Um, pregnant bodies and the condition of pregnancy have long stood as human symbols and metaphors for being and becoming. Yet it is important and necessary to remain focused and grounded also in their bodily and material realities, particularly in this time of global crises when the impacts of climate change have been compounded by the experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic and amplified by racialized socioeconomic inequalities 
and health inequities. Pregnant bodies especially bear the consequences of these intersecting effects and forms of structural violence. They both present and represent the vulnerabilities, potentialities, imperatives, and opportunities of this moment. The aim of my talk today is to make two interconnected points that turn back onto each other. One is the importance and necessity of centering reproduction and pregnancy in particular in order to effectively and meaningfully address global human crises, notably climate change. The other is the fruitfulness of approaching embodied pregnancy as multiplicities, a concept that I developed from the work of sociocultural and biological anthropologists examining reproduction. It is one that I assert can and ought to contribute to our thought and action on human emergence and global emergency. To meaningfully approach reproduction and the crises that imperil it and us requires the integrated perspectives of the humanities, arts, and natural and social sciences. Especially well poised for this project then is our discipline of anthropology, which in the United States has been conceptualized ideally as a holistic enterprise. Although it has been too frequently the rule rather than the exception that most anthropologists speak only with others within our own subfields, the study of reproduction is one of these areas of robust exception. Another area is in the study of environment, climate, and anthropogenic change. I suggest we look to anthropology for a process of incorporating knowledge about humans that is much needed to meet the crises imperiling the world that we have built on this planet. Human pregnancy is frequently discussed in terms of the mother-infant dyad, which emphasizes bounded singularities of pregnant, of pregnant woman and gestating fetus. This dyadic relationship has been commonly described in terms of maternal fetal conflict or competition in biomedicine. Yet human pregnancy is experienced as the unboundedness of self and others, or as feminist philosopher Iris Marion Young observed in her pioneering essay, Pregnant Embodiment, Subjectivity and Alienation. In pregnancy, I literally do not have a firm sense of where my body ends and the world begins. Moreover, as discussed in the sociocultural and biological fields of anthropology, human pregnancy is embodied by and of multiplicities that encompass a blurring not only of bodies and selves, but also of future, present, and past. In this talk, I argue for a concept of multiplicities based on an understanding of pregnancy that is holistic, not reductive and dichotomized. I use multiplicities, which calls attention to the quality or state of being multiple or various, rather than multitudes, which is defined as a quantity or a large number and reinforces the notion of discrete bodies, selves and persons. I also prefer multiplicities over multiplicity in order to emphasize the plural. Next, I make a case for placing reproduction and pregnancy at the center of scholarly analyses and agendas for change. I discuss the particular vulnerabilities of pregnant bodies as reported in studies of the climate related impacts on human health and reproduction. As an exercise in thinking through multiplicities, I have organized this discussion in terms of the earthly elements, earth, air, fire, and water as they have been conceptualized in a number of non-Western and Western traditions. Environmental philosopher David McCauley describes earthly elements as not objective things in themselves, unmediated presences or first principles, but instead as the parts through which we come to know the whole and through our concrete experiences of them. That is the aspects of the world we perceive with our senses and our bodies. This elemental perspective 
may shape thought and action on climate change. I'll end this talk with a consideration of the interconnectedness of reproductive, climate and environmental, and racial justice, that is an integrated human justice. Why it's worth introducing and developing a new term and concept like multiplicities to frame our approaches to and perspectives on reproduction is that ideas too are part of the conditions of our everyday lives. The slippages between metaphor and thought and action have real and material consequences. Historically, the image of the womb as a vessel is a long lasting one found in many cultures. Pregnant bodies have been not only likened to and understood as vessels, but also treated as such. There are also the ordinary ideas and practices reflecting and reinforcing the assumptions that what's contained in these vessels matters more than the vessels themselves. These include the celebratory attentions typically given to new babies, but not necessarily to new mothers or fathers or parents. It's in reaction against the cultural ascription of female reproductive bodies as containers and the assignment of lesser value to the containers than to their contents that women have asserted their worth and significance and organized social movements over the years. Since the 1960s, women in the United States, using the political and legal frameworks available to them, have demanded the recognition of their rights of ownership, privacy, freedom, and choice over their own bodies. In recent years, the limitations and even pitfalls of these discourses have come to be acknowledged. The goal has become clarified as reproductive justice, which the sister song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective defines as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. In particular, reproductive justice addresses a critical problem with the framing of reproductive rights, the apparent impossibility of meaningfully valuing both the people who are pregnant and the children who are imagined or expected from these pregnancies. Not only is each conceived as a singular and bounded entity with its own separate priorities, but these entities are already assumed to be locked into an antagonistic relationship with their competing interests. The terms and metaphors used in biomedicine even refer to pregnancy as a maternal fetal conflict or liken the fetus to a parasite. This reductive dichotomy has not kept pace with an increasingly sophisticated understanding of embodied pregnancy as described and explained in sociocultural studies and the biological sciences. The development and discussion of a concept of multiplicities draw from both of these sources. For an understanding of experience, I look to ethnography and sociocultural anthropology, including my own research on pregnancy in the United States. Biological anthropology, with its focus on human biology from an evolutionary and comparative perspective, offers insights into the interactions between the range of, of primate species, to which I always remind my cultural anthropology students, modern humans belong, <laughs> um, and their, in their environments. Uh, it illuminates what is shared with other species and what is distinct about modern humans, including our experience of embodied pregnancy. Biological anthropologist Julianne Rutherford cautions against, quote, the idea that the experience and environment of pregnancy constitute an event that produce a singular individual called the fetus. She draws from recent research on genetic complexity and experiential connectivity to correct our understanding of the fetus as an easily definable entity with clear boundaries. And instead, she describes it as borderless, a notion that in this talk I translate into multiplicities. Quote, 
This borderlessness is in large part due to the lived experience within the womb and the role of the placenta as the interlocutor between mother and fetus, genetically and somatically overlapping yet distinct entities existing simultaneously in overlapping yet distinct ecologies in different life history phases. Rutherford reminds us that reproduction as genetic inheritance and transmission involves not only two parents, but traces through the two parents of each of these two parents and what we with Euro-American logic call backwards in time through multiple generations and ancestors retrospectively. Clearly, it is inadequate to approach pregnant bodies and fetuses as singularities because the relationship between them literally and metaphorically forms and defines each. A pregnant body is one that gestates a fetal body and is no longer pregnant when there is no embryo or fetus. In turn, a fetal body cannot come into or continue its existence without a pregnant body. Thus, when looking at pregnant bodies located within relationships and the spaces and places that the bodies themselves present and represent, it seems sufficient to say that pregnancy comprises not of two individualities, but perhaps of a single duality. However, duality too is limited because it still emphasizes the partible individuality of mother and infant and is descriptive of the pregnant relationship only at a given point in time. Yet reproduction is the opposite of stasis. It is a dynamic process of combination and recombination or continuity and change at every level from genes to culture and society that occurs across generations. Pregnancies are large. Pregnant bodies contain not only multitudes, but multiplicities. In pregnancy, we might look prospectively to the generation in the making and the multiple ones that we imagine might follow. Research in genetics today is concerned not only with the genomic or what is inherited at conception, but also the epigenomic or what is expressed and or altered under specific environmental experiences. Notably, there is significant work guided by the paradigm of the developmental origins of health and disease, or DOHAD. It connects later adult life with experiences of early life, including not only childhood, infancy, and the experiences of the parents, uh, especially the mother during pregnancy, but also those of the parents' parents, and so on. Um, so I put up an image of uh, Zanita Thayer and Teresa Gildner's chapter in our handbook, uh, which explores the excellent overview of, the, of this material. Putting pregnancy and reproduction at the center of our attention then requires that we talk, think, and act about and as not singularities, dyads, or even dualities, or multitudes, but as multiplicities. This is an especially important and necessary perspective when thinking about earthly existence and human emergence as global emergencies, particularly in this moment of climate crisis. An understanding of the human impacts on earthly ecologies and the consequences for our embodied selves is doubtlessly part of our story as a species. Biological anthropologists have noted that non-human primates too adapt their behaviors and alter their environment, environs uh, suggesting that culture is perhaps not unique to humans. Archaeologists have documented the range of modifications to landscapes that prehistoric peoples have made, while ethnographers have observed that foragers, however more lightly they tread, also leave their marks on the earth. The intensified nature of our human impacts on our world, however, and especially there's devastating bodily consequences for reproduction now pose problems for our making that threaten to be our unmaking. 
The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, the United Nations Agency charged with gathering and reporting data on the observed changes in the Earth's climate system, issued its sixth assessment report in August 2021, stating in its strongest language yet, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the environment, ocean, and land. Most alarming was IPCC's finding that global warming is occurring even faster than had been previously understood. In addition to rising land and ocean surface temperatures, the report discusses evidence of changes in the salinity and acidity of ocean waters, loss of polar sea ice, and a rise in the global mean sea level. The changes in the larger climate system are experienced with particular immediacy and drama in extreme climate and weather events, such as heat waves, wildfires, droughts, and floods that have become more frequent and intense. In turn, the impacts on humans already documented include conflicts, displacements, and the losses of livelihood and, and lives, which too produce effects that become compounded and multiplied over time. Climate change has been characterized rightly as an emergency. Yet also, Rebecca Solnit reminds us, climate change is global scale violence against places and species, as well as against human beings. More particularly, the harm and suffering of climate change must be understood as what we anthropologists call structural violence. Climate change affects everyone, but it does not affect us all in the same ways or to the same degrees. Thus, we need to talk, think, and act in terms of what Martine LaPay, Robin Jeffries Hine, and Hannah Landecker described as embodiment in unequal, in unequal environments. Some people are and will be protected and even insulated by their wealth or class, race or gender. Many others are and will be made uh, further vulnerable and exposed. The impacts of climate change are observed already to be disproportionately borne by girls and women. Recent and current research into the epigenomic and developmental origins of health and disease raise concerns about the effects that are and will be inherited and reproduced by the generations that follow. These include consequences for female and male fertil fertility, infant and child development and growth, a range of sicknesses in adulthood. It has even been asserted that it may be unethical to have children at all. This discussion of the climate of reproduction and the impacts on pregnancy is drawn from reports on climate change. It's organized by the earthly elements of earth, air, fire, and water. The numbering of four and the naming of these substances are specific to the writings of ancient Greek thinkers, so this particular framework cannot be taken as culturally universal. Nevertheless, the notion of earthly elements will be familiar to people informed by knowledge systems of diverse societies and cultures. In these various systems, a relationship of balance or harmony among the elements has been recognized as essential to the continuing is existence of each and all. Without air, fire cannot burn. Without water, there's no growth of plant or animal on earth. Neither the parts nor the whole can exist without the other. Elemental perspective then is powerful and especially promising in this moment because it is based on the perception of the multiplicities of what we call our world, planet, or natural environment, and on our bodily experiences and embodied interactions with and within its multiplicities, other humans, non-human animals, plants, rocks, and more. Earth. In various cultural traditions, earth as land and soil, and earth as world and planet, become gendered female and described in terms of the maternal, even revered and feared as mother. 
This association is not only a metaphor, but also a fully realized relationship of the past and present. The Food and, um, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations tells us women comprise 37% of the world's rural agricultural workers overall, and almost 50% of farmers in low-income countries. In addition, they are about half of the world's small-scale livestock managers. That is, they keep and raise animals for food um, or for products such as eggs or milk. Women are also about half of the labor in small-scale fisheries. Ecofeminist Greta Gard notes that although women and girls are the majority of the world's producers of food, they are also the majority of the world's hungry and food insecure. In periods of acute or long-term need, for example, mothers have been observed to forego their own meals so that their children can eat. Social and cultural preferences frequently favor feeding sons over daughters. Over time, as is being demonstrated in DOHAD research, both short-term and chronic deprivation can have lasting consequences across generations. Air. Writer Kendra Pierre-Lewis uh, highlights air pollution as a particular problem of environmental racism. Air pollution, or more precisely pregnant women's exposure to it, is linked to preterm births or births that occur before 37 weeks of pregnancy. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that between 2014 and 2019, the incidence of preterm births rose with the highest rate among black mothers, 14.4%, about 50% higher than among white mothers, 9.3%, uh, and Hispanic mothers, 10% in 2019. Air pollution may be connected directly with the higher rates of COVID-19 deaths among Black Americans. The risks of COVID-19 for severe disease and even death are elevated for people with so-called pre-existing health conditions, such as heart disease and asthma, which are being investigated as the long-term consequences of pregnant women's exposure to air pollution as well as other forms of damage to the lungs that accumulate over years or lifetimes breathing poor quality air. Air and breath have particular significance in the larger context of structural racism that takes brutal form in police violence against Black citizens. I can't breathe were the final words of George Floyd, a 46-year-old Black man who died under the knee of a white police officer. His death sparked massive protests for racial and social justice, even amid recommendations and requirements for social distancing in, co uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, not only in the US, but around the world. The movement for Black Lives, um, not surprisingly, includes environmental and reproductive justice. Fire. The number of wildfires in California in July 2021 was already three times higher than in July 2020, which was previously the worst year on record. The smoke and fine particulate matter suspended in the air forced millions of people to stay indoors, even though this did not necessarily ease breath for anyone. The long-term impacts on human bodies remain to be seen. Climate scientists in North America and Europe also reported record-setting heat in 2020, with temperatures rising three to six degrees Celsius above average in the Arctic regions, and warned of the signs of accelerated warming in the Northern Hemisphere. At the same time, there are also incidences of record cold temperatures. One 2009 study using a statistical model forecast that these extremes in ambient temperature and the heat and cold stress they put on pregnant bodies will have del deleterious effects on fetal health. A 2019 study suggests that with greater maternal heat exposure in early pregnancy comes greater burden of congenital heart disease. 
More hopefully, however, the authors of this study note, generally, all weather-related diseases are preventable. Water. The majority of the Earth's victims of ecological disasters are women and children, as Gard reminds us. Of the people who died in the tsunami of 2004 in Aceh, Sumatra, more than 75% were women. In the catastrophic cyclone and flood of 1991 in Bangladesh, it was 90%. In addition to these storm surges and floods, Rising sea levels result in saltwater intrusions of freshwater sources on which people depend for fishing, farming, and drinking. A 2011 study in Bangladesh found higher rates of gestational hypertension and preeclampsia and eclampsia in women living in coastal communities than in women living further inland. Preeclampsia and eclampsia are conditions of dangerously high blood pressure during pregnancy and birth, combined they are the cause of 16% of maternal deaths in middle and low income countries. The consequences of contaminated and polluted water on people have been well known for years, and yet communities of color continue to suffer from preventable harms and injuries. In Flint, Michigan, a majority black city, scientists have been documenting the compounding crises that are directly linked to the city's polluted drinking water. Um, these include a 12% decrease in fertility rates and an estimated 58% increase in miscarriages and stillbirths, as well as effects on weight and overall health at birth. I've described some of the consequences of the structural violence inflicted on pregnant bodies in this moment of climate crisis compounded and amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic and by racialized socioeconomic inequalities and health inequities. To conclude, however, I want to reflect on the opportunities to work toward reproductive, climate and environmental, and racial socioeconomic and health justice. In a word, the goal is an integrated human justice. It will take a coalition of movements informed by the holistic perspectives that the anthropology reproduction can offer. Anthropologist Elizabeth Hoover describes the historic harms to and the resistance and advocacy of the native people of Akwesasne, a Mohawk community of 15,000 living on both sides of the St. Lawrence River, which forms a, a geopolitical boundary of the US and Canada. The river had been developed into the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1954, bringing industrial manufacturers like General Motors and Alcoa just upriver from Akwesasne. The detrimental environmental impacts became quite visible in the altered local landscape and in the elevated rates of various types of cancer and of infertility and miscarriages. Hoover connected these disruptions of reproduction with disruptions of food ways, which, entail, which in turn entail a web of language, culture, family, and interspecies relations. So it had to do with the fish and the fishing and all the lore that goes around teaching generations to fish and the actual eating of it. What was disrupted was reproduction in all of its dis dimensions, from biology, the infertility and miscarriages, to sociality, to the sharing of Mohawk culture and language from one generation to the next. It is out of this experience of environmental and reproductive injustice that Mohawk people, led by midwife Katsi Cook, have been raising a movement for environmental reproductive justice. Hoover quotes Cook, I see that reproductive justice and environmental justice intersect at the nexus of woman's blood and voice. Civil rights advocate and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw introduced the idea of intersectionality as a critical response to and an intervention against the tendency to treat race and gender as mutually exclusive categories of experience and analysis. Specifically, Crenshaw's aim 
was to center black women in this analysis in contrast in order to contrast the multidimensionality of black women's experience with the single access analysis that distorts these experiences. Similarly, feminist anthropologists Faye Ginsburg and Raina Rapp, in their pioneering and influential work, asserted the importance and necessity of putting reproduction at the center of attention. First, doing so reflects the reality of, of women's and people's lived experiences, from household, family, and kin, to biomedicine, to law, institutions have been organized around the bearing, birthing, and raising of children. Second, not doing so offers only a partial or even grossly distorted understanding of people's needs, wants, and lives. Thus, the success or failure of movements to address global human crises will depend on approaching them in their interconnected entireties, that is, their multiplicities. In conclusion, pregnancy is both a metaphor for being and becoming and a bodily and material reality. Attending to reproduction and pregnancies as multiplicities rather than as singularities or as dyads more adequately communicates the experiences of people in their everyday lives as documented in sociocultural anthropology and ethnography and unites them with more sophisticated understanding of reproduction in biological anthropology and the biological sciences. A concept of multiplicities enables us to give meaningful value both to pregnant bodies and to imagined or expected children. It engages us to think about pregnancies as bodies and relationships inhabiting spaces and places as well as time and temporalities. Thus, to act on these specific pregnant bodies in this particular time is also to act on the generations of the past and the future. By regrounding how we think and talk about reproduction and human multiplicities in earthly elements, we take on and take up holistic perspective, words, thoughts, and actions to sustain us in what will be the hard work ahead toward human justice. So, many thanks for your attention. That's all I got for now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Han. Uh, what a wide scoped human narrative via reproduction to tie into so many broad, current, huge issues and i'll just say that if you like the content of what you just heard all of that's in the handbook again <laughs> uh, if you touched on <laughs> uh, which is fresh off the press literally this week i think it's official that it's out so this is like the book launch for it with the sweeping scope we've just heard so we have now about 20 minutes open for questions and dr frink will handle the chat so for our virtual audience feel free to post your questions in chat and Dr. Frink will moderate for our in-person audience. You can post via your devices or um, you can, um, I can try to, I guess, give you or, or channel them to me, but I, either way, uh, we can raise questions. I'll start us off though, while we're allowing us to weigh the questions we'd like to raise, which would be with the focus on pregnant bodies during this COVID era that itself is arguably tied into the increased rate of zoonotic uh, transmission. The more we've expanded in numbers and uh, changed environments in ways that make us more vulnerable to zoonotic transmission, this is not going to be the last time we're having discussions like this. But um, a couple things that are, I think, quite timely would be to think about if you were pregnant now, and Dr. Han, maybe you've kept a pulse on this, that what, what are sort of the, the discussions about whether to have or not have a baby during this moment of COVID? And then secondly, um, we also live with all these discussions of social media and partisanship and so forth. Um, let's say you're pregnant and you're weighing getting vaccinated. Um, mm -hmm. How do you get information to shape your approach to that decision, knowing it impacts you, your, your, your fetus and uh, others and so forth? 
So I, I, I mean those in the broadest ways, just to, to throw them out there to, to start the discussion of, say, pregnant bodies during a, a time of COVID, environmental change, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are really interesting questions. And and, and actually, I'll, I'd like to say, like, I, I see all the black squares on my, my screen. So if anyone else has thoughts to just jump in also, because I'm curious to hear it, like, because I'm an ethnographer, I like listening to people. But, but the, the question of um, having or not having a baby in the time of COVID, that's so interesting. Because if you, if you remember, like, back in like, April, May of 2020, like, people started speculating on like, um, what they call quarantines. Like the idea that we were going to have these, like, that people would start having, because of lockdowns and shutdowns and so on, that people were going to start uh, having these babies and that at the end of the pandemic, there'd be all these births occurring, right? And um, that struck me immediately as like, uh -uh. like, that's not um, that what we were forgetting to think about at that moment or what the, what the, uh, the, what the press was excitedly talking about um, in this mo during that moment of lockdown. They, what they forgot is that during times of uncertainty, right, and tumult, that's when people are not thinking about having babies. So I, I thought that was um, that was a strange discourse that was occurring in in media. Perhaps it was a fun distraction, but I, I was I was thinking that in terms of. Um, if you look at uh, historical precedents, that that's really not, I mean, you saw births after the stock market, like tumbles in 2007, you saw a depression in births. So um, one would imagine a global pandemic is not going to spur more births. It's going to probably depress people's plans. And it's really interesting in casual conversations I have with my undergraduate students, um, I'm, uh, it, they, when we talk about speculatively, like when in the future would, might, might you want to have families? Is this something you think you want to do? And actually um, more and more students are like, well, I'm not sure, right? They're, they're pretty blunt about being like, I don't, I don't think I have to um, uh, follow the course that my parents followed and their parents and so on, that, that, that perhaps we actually ought to think about different decisions at this point in time. And it's really interesting. I, I think that um, I'm actually, uh, when I teach the anthropology reproduction course for my undergraduate next semester, I think we might in incorporate a kind of interviewing exercise to ask students, like, what are their attitudes and feelings in this particular moment of time uh, about um, what are they thinking about uh, in terms of, of reproduction? Um, the other question about that, I wish Cecilia Tamori was with us because she's, uh, you know, she does the global, uh, global health studies at um, in the School of Nursing and, and School of Public Health at Hopkins. And she is like, this is her crusade is to like try to correct misinformation about vaccines. And she's uh, her background is in um, breastfeeding and uh, child childbearing and childbirth stuff. And so she is definitely one of those people who's out there trying to get out the word, uh, inform the care providers better. Uh, on how to address these questions about um, getting the vaccine, but the underlying advice is yes, please get the vaccine, right? <laughs> please, that's 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 the the way to go. But in terms of how you get out that information, and and correct, I mean, the hard part is the correcting misinformation, right? Um, uh, and uh, I think um, because of the position that she is in, she's talking mostly to like the care providers or to the people who instruct care providers, right? Um, and then how you get that message to people, it's, um, I, I, think, um, I think most of us have seen that the best, the, the most sensible advice seems to be like, you have to do it through the people you know. So if you go to your primary care, you have a, a family doctor, you go to, um, or the people that you know around you, that, that, that it's such a, uh, it's such a like, it seems like such a slow way of getting out the word, but it's really the only effective way, right? The most effective way of getting out the word. Hi, hi, Dr. Han. Dan Beneshek here. Hi. Uh, first of all, th thanks so much for for your for your uh, really interesting talk. Um, you know, I'll I'll just chime in here, picking up on Peter's questions about talking about pregnancy and childbirth. Um, uh, during the COVID pandemic, the global pandemic. And my research recently has been working with 
uh, midwives both in the U.S. and in the U.K. And one of the issues that's come up has been the real concern of so many pregnant women during the, the pandemic regarding social support. Because one of the things that's happened with the pandemic is, of course, with all of the quarantining and people in lockdown and getting all their groceries delivered and, you know, people literally not leaving the house much. I mean, I, that certainly is, is, is familiar to me in thinking about, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, particularly at the height of the, the start of the pandemic. And the real concern and anxiety by so many pregnant women about uh, the lack of support and help, particularly not only during pregnancy, but especially, of course, with newborns. Mm -hmm. And uh, just wondering if you might comment on that. This seems like perhaps, you know, a, a, a relatively new challenge for us in this global age of pandemics and our, our, our public health responses to them, which, of course, are necessary and important, but really do isolate um, uh, uh, new moms and families uh, and, and cut off that, that, uh, that vital uh, social support. So just your comments on that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I told, I want to hear more about that midwifery stuff. Like that sounds so awesome. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, we knew that even before COVID, right. That, 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 that the social support is something that, um, uh, I mean, my, my, what I'm more familiar with is the U S I don't know the UK example, except the reading about it. But like, what we know is that women in the U.S. have all, have long felt isolated, that they that they uh, really wanted more social support, and it's kind of interesting that there's there are these. Um, if you're lucky, you have these informal networks, like maybe you have sisters or maybe you have some friends or neighbors. But because like, because we're often like people like pursue careers and education, and they're often distant from their families and and from people they grew up with, and so you don't necessarily have those fallback built in networks you have to go out and actively create these networks and so um uh, i remember like um when i was doing my pregnancy research i was in a university town and so they, everybody there was transplanted from somewhere else and so what did everybody do they joined a group right so you'd find like a play group or a la leche league chapter or something right and and so it's really interesting the way that um these kind of formal groups and <laughs> or formal kind of organizations um, that th those became really important ways that people connected with each other and then found each other. And then even, I remember one woman w was saying how like, she happened to be with her baby, like walking toward a public library and so saw another woman with a baby who looked around the same age. And she's like, I practically stopped that woman to like talk to her because it was just so hard. Like it, she felt like it was so hard to otherwise make connections. So I agree, like in the, con I've, I've actually, you, you're, you raised this question that I've been wondering about a lot. I have, for example, just anecdotally, I have like cousins who had babies during COVID and like I regularly check in on them because I'm like, how's it going? Like, um, because I'm concerned because I, I do, I recall how much support I really wanted and needed, um, particularly in those first few months. And of course, that's when you probably feel the most vulnerable and, um, in terms of like, I would, you know, I would, I would probably have been very worried. And I think my cousins were very worried about, you know, being around other people with their, with their infants, um, with their newborns. So what this means at this moment, I mean, it's kind of like, um, I'm actually on this other um, uh, research project with some, with three other anthropologists, the academic care work project. And one thing that we've been tracking in there is we started this project with like, 2015, 2016, and we were just talking about, it was just an, uh, academic anthropologists and how hard it is to, to take care of people while you're also trying to do your academic career. Um, but, uh, I, you know, and I feel like the, the interviews I've done lately, uh, or I did most recently on that, it just felt like um, everything is now like on Zoom and that does not work. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that that that's that's such a good point. I you know, and I and that I was actually going to follow up with that and say, you know, I think we've tried to compensate with family and friends, particularly those that maybe have newborns, to try to check in as you did with your friend more often and uh, have those those Zoom chats with grandparents and so forth. But it's not quite the same, I think, as you know. So oftentimes, 
uh, so often you need you not only need the social support, right, the the, the emotional support, but you also need actual help, <laughs> help with your newborn, help with uh, laundry, help with uh, picking up groceries or making meals, and that's just something you can't do via Zoom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, can you hold my baby while I take a shower? Like, that's what like I remember like people doing that. For, like, I had a friend come over. And she held my newborn while I took a shower, you know, and she also brought me food and, and we can't do that anymore, or, or we're not supposed to, or, or, um, and I remember being very hesitant to offer my help to someone I was like, well, I'm vaccinated. It's okay. Would you let me in your house? Um, and if you're uncomfortable with that, I totally understand that. Right. And then I even contemplating getting tested and showing up after I'd been tested, like, um, so it becomes all of a sudden very complicated to offer help and receive it. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm, 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 I'll be so, I'll look forward to, to, to reading and hearing more about your work on that with the midwives. I, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. that yeah, no, thanks. And for uh, others in the audience, uh, feel free to unmute. There you go, Dr. Frank. But for others, I, I know we've got folks who actually do research in Anthrode Reproduction. Kristen, you're here and you have a chapter in this volume too. So again, feel free to weigh in. Uh, I, I have a quick question. Thanks so much for your presentation. Really interesting. Why, I was very interested. Why are women and children more susceptible to environmental disasters as you were talking about? Uh, yeah. What's going on there with the research? Yeah, no, I, I was actually, so I'm actually starting, just starting to like um, really read through that a little bit closer. So like the um, Greta Gard's work where she, she's the eco-feminist eco um, uh, philosopher rather. And when I read her review um, about in particular, like the flood, the floods and the, the tsunami, um, I think among the other things, among some of the things that she's talking about is like, who got left behind in certain kinds of situations, who were, and also who had, who was more isolated and maybe didn't hear the warnings or, or, and in some cases, like the warnings just didn't, like they had no time, right? And so who was left in the, in the, um, in these low lying areas, like doing various kinds of work or in the homes or shelters. So it's actually kind of interesting to pick through why, what specifically are those situations in which you had so many women who were left behind in these places, right? Um, so yeah, no, I need to, I actually need to investigate that a little more. It, it was something that really immediately jumped out at me and, and I've been like, I have this file somewhere on my desk where I'm trying to actually like print it out some stuff to start reading about that some more. Yeah. Well, it makes sense, the vulnerability on so many levels of women and children that we know of. It, it, it makes sense when I heard that, I was like, oh, but I, but I wonder how that, operationalizes right thank yeah, you yeah exactly much. yeah I, I also wonder if like like you know like <laughs> our notion of what's safe right so you had children and women who were together and they were in maybe enclosed domestic kinds of spaces right or or not enclosed they could be outdoors but they were together and so there's this notion of safety right but of course in the context of a tsunami or a flood very unsafe right so um, so I, I, I'm kind of interested in that, right? Like, like what, what, what are these, like, how do we construct safety? And then how is the, how are those ideas about safety actually not that safe at all? Right. I, that that's, that's also what's going on with pandemic, right? <laughs> like, how do we construct ideas about what's safe and what isn't and how it actually works against each other? So, yeah. <laughs> Hey there, I can jump in. Hi, hey. hi Sally, it's nice to see you. So it's Kristen here. I'm sitting in Alyssa's office on a quick break, but um, I have a question from Alyssa and I was gonna kind of jump in and just talk really briefly about what Dan had already brought up and what you guys discussed. Um, I'm a local doula here in town and every Thursday I go to this event called a milk bar and it's where all the moms come in and they you know, get lactation support and they just hang out with their community. And one thing I've really noticed on the discourse of the pandemic is how stressed they are about the masks and like missing, um, you know, facial expressions and their kids are are growing up without being able to see like the whole full range of emotions. And that's been like such a such an important topic for the moms that are 
that are at this milk bar. And I just think, you know, I'm, I'm pregnant myself. And you, you think about these things and many, in many ways, the rejection of the science and the government is because they're thinking of the long-term consequences for their kids, right? They're not thinking of the immediate, are they going to get sick? They think they're going to survive if they do get sick. So it doesn't matter. We're not thinking of the long-term health consequences. We're thinking of the long-term social consequences. And I think that's been, been the big conversation within the, the local community where I work with moms. So I just wanted to add that in. And then um, I have actually a question from Melissa who's calling in. So she texted it to me. Okay. Um, so given your wide ranging research, what is the next big step we need to take as scientists working on reproduction? So what's our role to address um, reproductive injustices? Ooh, um, well, one, <laughs> um, let's see, that's a really great question. So um, Kristen, that is so cool to hear about the milk bar. I'm like, <laughs> that's so exciting to hear about that work. And I, I totally agree with you about like, so the advice, like, I mean, that's the thing, that's where you realize like, public health advisement is not the same as, right? Like, it, it's actually, unfortunately, not the same as like what people are actually worried about. And so I, I love what you just said about like, you know, they're about the, the concerns about long-term social consequences, right? And so, it, um, so yet again, it's kind of like what I was saying before about like, how do we define or construct what's safe? And then also like, what as a parent is supposed to be your responsibility, right? Like it, what's the, so there's the conflicts and the response of like, how are you taking care? What does it mean to take care of this child, right? And so the idea that like, well, um, I'm, I, my, I, the, the long-term consequence and risk that I'm taking by not exposing my child to um, social cues, to affection, to, right? Um, that these outweigh, right, what may be perceived as like the minimal risks of other kinds of exposures or, or consequences. So, um, yeah, the the um, and public ad, public health advisement gives us nothing on that, right? It tells us nothing about like doesn't this matter too? Like doesn't um, shouldn't we also pay attention? Should, why are we dismissing, in fact, some of these very real questions that people? because they're being responsible, because they're trying to act out of responsibility and care, that that's what they're concerned about. So um, that's just, uh, yeah, that's so interesting, especially the whole facial expression thing. I've heard a number of parents worrying about like their children staying at home during these first couple of years and whether or not like how like their linguistic or language skills or and social skills will develop. Um, so one of the things I've said, like, oh, go read some linguistic anthropology, because it turns out not all, not everybody in every culture talks to their babies anyway, it's, right? It's going to be okay. But but the facial thing is, that's a different issue than the talking to the babies, right? So that's, that's some right. Else. It's just so interesting because you look at the conversations that are happening and how we view the world as academics and researchers and public health interests is so different than what's happening on the ground. And so you know, it's like, how do you, how do I interact with these people as someone who works in the science field, but as someone who's also, you know, their doula or someone that's helping with lactation support. So it's, it's, it's like really interesting trying to maneuver with all the different personalities and like the different quirks. But I do understand, like, I, I can empathize with like being concerned about the masks because I'm, you know, in my own private office, it's nice to be able to interact and see your face versus, you know, Peter over here, I can't see his face and how he's <laughs> talking because of the mask. So I think, you know, these are really valid concerns. And as we move forward in public health, you know, these are things that we have to talk about because this is why people reject the, the, you know, the advice. Yeah. And maybe that, that actually answers Alyssa's question, right? Which is like, like, what are the next big questions? Like when we take people's real life, everyday questions seriously, right? And, and we, and, and so like, let's not dismiss the, the, the questions that people have about, hey, does, does masking get in the way of, of child development and child skills, right? Like child linguistic development, like, instead of being dismissive of that, maybe we should actually like know something about it, right? right? Um, and so like maybe those are the big steps is like, like answer not only the questions that we understand frame some of this, you know, frame our science, but also like be able to say something about these very direct uh, lived experience kinds of questions. Right. Yeah. And your work as an ethnographer you know, has so much potential for things like that. And I think that's why this work is so important and how you can, you know, 
reframe the, the reproductive injustice talks. So thank you. That was a really great talk on my end. Thank you. Well, and then I, and I just love that I can like, because I do reproduction, I get to talk to like people across the fields of anthropology because like, I can't, I, I'm just like, this is the best place to learn anthropology is in reproduction actually. Well, well, at this moment we've hit 1230. Okay. So um, if, again, our audience, if you love this work, you have access through UNLV library to a virtual version of the brand new handbook that Dr. Hahn has co-edited. And you can again tell from today's scope and presentation how much there is in that volume, but also there is just to thinking about anthropology and reproduction. We could go on and on for hours, but we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll break for lunch, I guess, somewhere in there. Uh, or late afternoon snacks in New York. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Hahn, for joining us today at UNLV virtually. We are very appreciative, and thanks for our audience too for joining us. Uh, take care, everyone, the rest of your Monday. Thank you. Thanks so much. So good to meet you all. Thanks.